Excellent. Well, why don't we jump right in to Message Center updates. Mike, what has been happening? What's going gonna, on? I'm going to jump right in, Christian. So, All right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> Exchange Server Vulnerability Update. Everybody knows what's going on there, I hope. If you haven't, you're living under a rock. And uh, what's happened is last Patch Tuesday. Yay, Patch Tuesday. Uh, last Tuesday, they released 89 patches. 15 of them were for the zero day. Uh, that has affected exchange. So uh, what I found interesting about that is that they are just now on March 9th actually sending out uh, the notification to exchange administrators to say, hey, you might want to think about patching these servers. Um, that official announcement actually went out on March 9th in the news channel um, that goes into M365 for administrators. Um, and I found that it extremely disturbing that it would take that long for them to to release something like that but but mike it is optional though so i, yeah. I have in this free society stylishly I choose late. for myself yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah just like getting that vaccine shot yeah yeah um so uh moving on uh one point or uh, one point one drive and share point uh remember uh I don't know, maybe it was like three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, we talked about uh, they were going to uh, take the send link to Outlook. Do you remember this conversation, Sean? When the send link to Outlook was going to be retired? Remember yeah, that? I seem to recall that. Guess what? They're not doing it anymore. Um, they actually listened to the users. Wow. I guess there was a big uprising uh, in the, uh, the Microsoft forums about when they were going to do this. Now they say, you know what? We're not going to do it anymore. So uh, they basically come out and say uh, that that the Outlook sharing option will remain until further notice. And did, thank you did for your feedback. Did executive shout out psych as well? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, when the crowd shouts you down, I guess you win. I think it, I think it's a great example of Microsoft actually listening to the users. You know, um, they made a decision. Uh, they listen to the users or something else on the back end, like, hey, some engineer came up and said, you know, we can't do this. Uh, uh, but, you know, the thing is, is that it, it's a good thing because people didn't want it to happen. So uh, moving on, Microsoft Teams, you now have an option coming up here to be mobile optimized network data usage, which means that they're actually going to offer inside of the mobile app the ability to change the, the setting where you can reduce the data used in the following circumstances, whether it's uh, a, a never, which is a default, cellular, or always. So if you're only on cellular, you can reduce the data usage um, that Teams uses. Uh, I'm assuming that that Teams uses an extraordinary large amount of data um, when you know you have a, a large meeting. So that's got to be a good thing. You know, I have to say that there's, I've seen quite a few people that are in a meeting will will jump f between mobile like as they're out being yep. mobile and jump it, it while in a meeting in between mobile and their other device right. and it's a uh, it works a lot better than you'd expect it to work um and it, it, it's uh I, I mean i experienced that with other people doing that maybe once or twice per week the fact um, that it so works at all is amazing <laughs> So the, the fact that you have the ability to change some of these settings so that you're using less data should only in theory improve that that experience. So then then you gotta you gotta come out with, you know, if they allow for policy, right? So if Intune uh, from an MDM perspective, a company goes out and says, Okay, we're gonna turn off or we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna flip the switch on that and change it from never to cellular. So then you're going to have users you're going to come back and you're going to say, hey, I can't see all the video feeds when I'm on my phone, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. Well, you know, it's all going to be, become part of the policy. So it's going to all, all be merged into that. Um, from an individual basis, I mean, I can understand people wanting to do it, but I think co corporations are going to have a little different take on it, especially if they're paying the bill. Right. Uh, SharePoint events. So this has been something that I have dealt with, uh, I, and you know me, I don't deal with SharePoint a lot at all, uh, but uh, SharePoint events never would allow you to put an image in with an event. That has just not been possible. 
And it's something that I always thought was really weird is that if you had an event and you had like a, you know, some kind of poster or something that went along with that event, you wanted to show that image. And they never, you know, that just wasn't possible before. So now mm-hmm. uh, they're going to begin rolling that out. So uh, late March, you know, they're going to start rolling it out and expect uh, everyone else to get it around late June. So um, let's see what else here. The last bit, at least we have the presenter view in Teams. So if I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but in presenter, in you use PowerPoint, you have the presenter view. I don't use that a lot. I think it's kind of annoying, actually. If I had a if I had a confidence monitor, if I'm up on stage and I have a confidence monitor, then I like presenter view. But when I'm using multiple screens, you know, I for some reason I just don't like that that view. Um, it kind of distracts me a little bit. But uh, now they're going to actually bring presenter view into Teams. So if you are the presenter, um, you can now in control. You can now see the presenter view just like you would in PowerPoint in the Teams meeting. So that's kind of cool. And if somebody comes in and takes control, they'll see the presenter view as well. See, I, I do use that a lot, especially doing webinars, um, things like that, having that to see what the builds are, have all your notes there, your kind of talking points. So it's really useful. So we'll see. I mean, the only thing I'm concerned about is I, I like I like presenter view where I've got the two giant monitors to mm-hmm. have it all within the team's workspace. I need to look at how it's used in the real estate. I'm a bit concerned about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they need to have an a pop out window. Yeah, yep. yeah. exactly. It need, yeah. needs to have a pop out. All right. And finally, uh, immersive reader. Does anybody here, I mean, uh, from a training perspective too, you know, uh, does anybody here really get into the immersive reader at all? You know, they're using Word and in, in Excel and stuff like that. Anybody here? I Where think it's gotten, more commonly really. used with email. Like, well, is it, well, wait, it's immersive reader. That's different than the read aloud that's, capability. That read well, aloud, you're thinking of immersive is is, is word. Yeah, it gets rid of all the the well, it's all the bells available. and whistles and stuff, and just lets you read things. There is right. a big push for immersive reader in the education space, and and for accessibility reasons, um, you know, there it's all that inclusivity and and yep. making sure people are. Um, we did work on a project for uh, K through 12 um, materials, and that was a big deal, making sure, sure everything was captioned and all of yep. that for the immersive exactly. reader. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what Microsoft is doing, immersive reader is now actually built not only into Word, but OneNote, Outlook, Teams, and other apps. So it's not just, you know, uh, pigeonhole the Word. Uh, but what they're going to be doing is now they're going to be making it available for SharePoint pages and news posts. So now you're going to be able to use that immersive reader. And this, I think it it kind of, what you said, it kind of goes back to, you know, um, diversity and inclusion and being able to, you know, accessibility, uh, being able to, to, uh, because what immersive reader says here is, uh, you know, uses techniques to improve reading and writing for people regardless of their age or ability. And that's kind of a 50,000 foot explanation, but um, it really just tries to, uh, you know, like you said, make it easier to read um, context um, and, to vi- and to hear it and visualize it. So I think that's kind of cool. They're actually going to bring it into SharePoint for, uh, they say, pages and news posts. Yeah. I, I love the, um, Shar, you mentioned it about the, um, the immersive reader also, like for accessibility concepts, mm-hmm. the accessibility features in um all of the office applications have been improved significantly in the last, I guess, I'd say the last couple months. And you can Especially with AI. Checking. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, AI has really taken a front and center with Microsoft. As we all know, if you, if you attended Ignite, I don't know, maybe 30% was all around AI and everything AI and this AI and that AI and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, they really put a big push for that. I think that's cool. I think that's really, really cool stuff. Um, I will say one last thing, uh, topic, Christian, and then we can move on, is does anybody else notice that in Microsoft Teams now they've taken away the ability, and I just noticed this this morning, I didn't see any announcement on it, but I was looking in my in my client, and if you click on the settings under your image and go to settings, they've taken away that that option where it allows you to see the preview features. So there used to be a checkbox there that would say, you know, if you want to see the advanced features or the preview features, 
and then it, Teams restart was required. It's not there anymore. So I don't know how Microsoft is handling that whole preview thing with Teams anymore, or if it's just like you have to be part of Insider. Depends I don't know. on the client. The last time that I checked that, uh, if you're using the standard desktop client, the, uh, the the preview features checkbox isn't there. However, at the same time, on the mobile, the the web client, it was. Oh. In fact, let me go take a quick look and see if it still is. I just found that interesting that it yeah. just went away because I was looking for the the large gallery view because again, depending what tenant I log into, I have I have different options and I always have to check because I log into one and I don't have large I don't have the large gallery, I only have you know the default and if I log into another one I have the large gallery option. It's crazy. I was just going <laughs> to say maybe you got kicked out of the cool kids club. <laughs> I have Ouch. no doubt. Then what am I doing here? Somebody yeah, sent you a message, here? Mike. I just verified that, Mike. Uh, <laughs> my my desktop Teams client does not show the preview feature checkbox. Uh, the web, the if you're connecting it up on the web, it does. So yeah, yeah there's a few the web things on does, Teams. Desktop doesn't. And as far as the gallery and some of the views and things, I find that varies depending on who's actually running the meeting. Yeah. yeah, um, it you know, I, I'll go to one meeting and things aren't available. I'll go to another one and suddenly they're there. I go to a third one, some of what's there was is, is still there, some of it isn't. So, it I, mean, I have no explanation for that at all, but Read the it, it's, it's desperately part. confusing. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not, it's not just about meetings as well. If you look at like conversations, the reply to feature inside a conversation works perfectly well in the mobile app. But I think everyone's team's desktop client, it's not there exactly. unless you're in a very, very early preview build. Yeah. Hey, hey, Sean, is that an app you can add as a tab? <laughs> it team's should be. tarot cards. What's <laughs> going to happen with be. the environment today? I don't know. Let's go find out together. <laughs> yeah. Something hey, might hey, be. Christian, there's, there's another skill. I actually do read, I genuinely read tarot cards. So <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what is there anything that Neil can't do? <laughs> That is the question. Play guitar very well, apparently. I can't do that very well. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a VR app. But, uh, eh. Well, good times. Hey, well, so as we move, thanks a lot for that, Mike, and for pulling those together. Uh, um, I know there. I see that you left off the list that I did get a message center update about something to do with Yammer, but uh, I didn't <laughs> well, read that. That's one. just that's just because. You know me and Yammer. That's a love-hate relationship. I, I, know, you know, I know it is. It's, uh, Maybe next week. Well, we'll yeah, see. well, yeah. I get All to right. pick and choose, so, you know, it, right. Yammer's just not at the top of my list. Well, as we uh, get, go into the, the Q&A portion of the live stream here, uh, it is time to share on screen our updated disclaimer. Oh uh, so we'll let that appear there. Oh, uh, the views and opinions back. expressed in this live stream are provided as is by the participants and who are, again, air quotes, experts on some Microsoft technologies, but do not claim to be experts in all Microsoft technologies and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, yeah, so it's great to have that back. Set your hair on fire. That's right. Well, with that, um, and I know that, and Neil, so you had provided uh, really an answer to the homework uh, two weeks ago um, about full fidelity migrations. Were you still doing some other footwork on that or, or is I that was, closed I was out? Gonna, it's kind of closed out, I think. Um, yeah. The documentation online, um, aka.ms slash SPMT, really has everything I have to say. It's all there. Okay. Um, Simon Badages is the PM for that and he, he's done a, you know, really he's on top of those the tech writers for keeping that content really up to date. And it's pretty much everything I would have to say is there. In fact, okay. no, in fact, everything I would have to say is there. That's right. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, well, then let's jump into the first one, kind of a broad question, <laughs> um, but Jonathan <laughs> asks, is Azure a good place to start <clears throat> learning cloud? Well, yeah, so <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> um, See, my son, who is an atmospheric sciences major, would say no, <laughs> no, 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 no. 
Um, no, and, and we can I understand w- the context, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I suppose he'd be specific about, about which cloud, too, though, Christian. Right. All roads well, lead to cloud, right? Well, I get this question a lot because, I mean, a lot of what I do is around Azure. I'm not an office MVP, as you guys know. I do more work in, in Azure than I do anywhere else. And uh, I get this question a lot about folks who come to me and be like, I want to learn about cloud. They'll either come to me with one or two statements. Either they'll say, I want to learn about Azure or I want to learn about cloud. <clears throat> and I say there's always a distinction between the two because Azure is you're learning about Microsoft specific Azure. Um, it, it doesn't, whatever Microsoft specific Azure, um, 90% of that doesn't apply to AWS. Okay. And it doesn't apply to Google Cloud. Um, and the re- what I mean by that is that if you learn one, okay, from a terminology, just from a terminology standpoint, you're not going to know what's going on in the other one. Mm-hmm. And that's because they do not match at all. And none, none of the three share common terminology between them. They have the same you know, maybe back-end fabric, the back, same back-end, you know, services that are provided. But Route 53 is not an Azure term, okay? Um, DNS, which yes. DNS should be the term, but AWS uses Route 53. So um, <clears throat> if you want to learn about cloud, I think, I personally think that Azure cloud is the easiest to learn. And that's just because of the fact that it uses basic concepts of cloud, all right? It, 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 it touches plain terminology, plain English, things around that are used in the cloud. But you have to get a fundamental. I don't know what the, what the baseline is they're going off of because they may not even know what a real cloud is. Is it, is it actually you know, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud? There's a whole bunch of different areas mm-hmm. that you can get into. So in, in terms of, yeah, we need more information of what they're trying to, what they want to learn. But if they want to start out, in my opinion, I think Azure is the easiest cloud to learn. And just from someone who has never touched the cloud before. Do you yeah, and I would generally, add, I would, oh, go ahead, Neil. I was say, I would add to that, Mike. I said, you know, one of the things that, that's, that's critical and, and I'm, 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 this is with my Microsoft hat. I, I, I agree Azure is, is easy to work with. I also work with AWS, right? So as I'm a, I work for Microsoft Azure product group, but at the same time, I work with many, many customers that are not just single cloud, right? They're, yeah. they're oh, yeah. multi-cloud platforms and, and it makes great business sense to be multi-cloud because if it there's is. a problem in Azure, you can fail over to AWS. If there's a problem in AWS, you can fail over to Azure. So that is a very, it's a very robust business model to operate in both. So, you know, is Azure a good place to start? Yes, it is. But I wouldn't neglect learning the others. Like you say, yeah. Route, Route 53, I built, um, when I, at the last in-person Ignite event, I built the workshop, all the VMs for the workshop. I deployed something like 6,000 servers across Azure. But did I use Azure DNS? No, I didn't. Why? Because Azure DNS is actually harder to work with than Route 53. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I used Route 53 for all of the DNS, for all of the students in the room, because it was easy to work with in PowerShell. So th- learning, learning multi-cloud, if you want to be relevant, if you want to be yeah. an attractive person to employ, Go down the path of learning multi-cloud. I, I totally agree with you, 150%. Um, I will make one note that Neil never mentioned Google Cloud once in that statement. Okay. <laughs> I, I did say multi-cloud. Right the beginning. So, it's, so by, in, in, I said multi, so inherently I'm including I'm that. just giving you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> hey, all clouds have their value, and I don't stick with which one. I mean, that's right, that's right. That's what I would say. Although all your really important stuff in Azure. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Slide that in the end. That's right. Keep the job. That's right. Well, there you go. All right. Well, here's my boss. <laughs> what can I say? Well, question number two. Um, Tom says, hi, all. A friend has asked. Okay, a friend has asked this mm-hmm. question. If a Teams meeting wasn't recorded at the time, has the video gone or is it stored somewhere? My thought is if it's not recorded, then it's gone at the end. Just wanted to check with the experts. There is it's no not video. recorded. There is, there is no not recorded. It never started. 
It's yeah, called it's, streaming. <laughs> it's done. Finished. End of yeah. question. Teams is not a surveillance tool. They're not recording 24-7. If you don't re- start the recording, it could be. It, it could be. It <laughs> will not go there, Mike. <laughs> Okay, folks, before you jump to the next question, I know I, I did mention I have to leave, so I'm going to drop out now before we get engaged on the next question. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I forgot to go early. No worries. Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks, Neil. You look Thanks, awesome. Neil. Thanks for uh, the luck of the Irish today. You, you're very welcome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I would have thought that uh, that Neil would have been much more pro-Microsoft in the statements given his outfit. <laughs> I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think you can. I don't think you can be anymore because it's the cloud is becoming a commodity. It really yeah. is. Just no, like, well, you think most partner solutions. There are very few partners again that are that are you know one one cloud. You you oh, have very few. Yeah. Right. And when we go in and architect something from a solution standpoint, even though I work on the Microsoft solutions team, we will whatever the whatever will make it for the customer, like Neil said. If Route 53 is going to handle the DNS better than Azure's DNS, we're going to we're going to architect that, um, you know, and storage as well. S3 can outperform Azure storage at some points doing certain things. So it all it all depends. Yeah. I'll take us back into Teams mode here, so I can be up on the screen too. Yay! <laughs> all right. So yeah. So Tom. Yeah, if you don't hit the record, it's not saved. It's gone. Sorry, dude. Sorry. All right, question number three. Helen, uh, hi, what's the best way of having a space in a SharePoint communication site where users can upload videos and watch other users' videos? Should I use Stream for that, or can I just use a library? My answer always that is what features are they looking for? Do they need... Um, does somebody just need to watch the video? Do they want the translation? The um, uh, what's it called when they it, it types out the words? <laughs> I can't think of the word. The uh, yeah, the transcription. Transcription. That one. <laughs> the other T word. Yeah. Do they need all of that? You know, and do they need like statistics as to who watched it and have people comment? It just depends on what tool they're looking for. Lots of ways to skin a cat. Yeah. So yeah, yes, yes, and yes, but yeah. what do you need, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I would default. You know, personally, I would default to stream for that capability for the reasons you just said. I mean, if you because you want it to be a searchable asset, so the fact that you upload it and don't have to do any extra steps, and it will go in and build the transcription, and then it's searchable. You know, and you know, it's just a great resource for that. Plus, it has. Um, the other viewing capabilities, you're not having to go through, you know, any other additional processing. So it's 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 the default um, video consumption location. The other, the other thing is if it's stored in stream, it can be displayed or shared across um, any site or any application. Whereas if it's stored in SharePoint, you're limited to that particular site that you're storing it in. Right. Well, and if it's OneDrive, it's in that person's OneDrive. So if they leave the company, now you've lost the asset. So I actually did a really cool project where we took the tr- the transcription, that T word, <laughs> and um, pulled it out and translated it and then put it back in. And that was the subtitles. So it created the subtitles in different languages. It was kind of cool. So you can't do that one driver SharePoint, unfortunately. Yeah. This is before we even <laughs> talk about media services and streaming and, and bit rate adapt- adaptive bit rates. And yep. Yep. Stream's a multimedia tool. SharePoint can do multimedia, but Stream is designed for it. Well, and I think a lot of people don't realize that you can store things in something like Stream and still display them in SharePoint or Teams. I think a lot of people think you have to store them in SharePoint to display them in SharePoint, and that's not the case anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so hence the reason I'm doing a webinar called Spoiler Alert, nothing actually lives in Teams. (laughs) So... Yeah. Are people genuinely surprised by that? That's... Yes, you'd be amazed. I get that question all the time. What lives mm-hmm. in Teams? I'm like, nothing. Nothing lives in Teams. It's a facade. It's all, yeah. 
I use the analogy that you've got you've got tools spread out all over your house, right? You're working on a project in your house. You can go over here and get that tool and bring it back. You can go over here and get that tool and bring it back. You can go over there and get that tool and bring it back. Or you can put them all in the darn toolbox and have them right there, right? That's what that's what Teams is. It brings all the tools into one place instead of having to go all over the place looking for the right tool. Well, that was also you know, when Teams launched, and and it's something that I still explain too. They say, well, do we need to go out and buy like specifically tools for backup and recovery and things for Teams? Like, well, it's not for Teams. Like, if you have those tools for SharePoint and Exchange, that's where that content lives. Mm-hmm. And there, there's going to be adjustments. There's new features and things coming out, and how Stream is handled, and kind of all those kinds of things. But um, but it, it, again, the, the assets, documents and files in SharePoint, conversations and meetings are in exchange. All right. Um, I have, I have oh, to yes? jump. Thanks, guys. Wow. Hey, thanks I, a lot. Care, Sherry. I goodness. put my, my uh, two cents in the chat if you need them. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Grab links later. Thank thanks you. a lot. <laughs> have a great day. Um, Sridey says, hi, can anyone suggest how to migrate PST files to Office 365 to exchange online without any migration tools? Without the migration tools? Well, drag and drop. File, open and export, import, export, import from another program or file, Outlook data file. There you have it. PST file is still a PST file. You just have to use the client app. Yeah, that's just what I just got through doing. From within Outlook, open and export, file, open and export, import, export, open another, import from another program or file, Outlook data file. Bingo, you're done. Uh, and well, Sherry's not provided quite, a link for that too. Not right. quite done, of course. Then you have to wait for the file to actually import. If it's a big file, it might take you a day or two, but nevertheless. The other thing that you can do with that is uh, open and export, uh, open Outlook data file, which simply opens the PST file. And then you can, at your leisure, drag and drop stuff from the PSD into your uh, Outlook 3, Office 365 mailbox. Either way it works. One's a little slower than the other. Um, the slower method, however, gives you the granularity to move what you want and not move what you don't want. Yep. I had thought that there was a, uh, maybe it was a third-party tool that allowed you to actually um, specify a PSD file and your um, exchange online account and it would automatically import the entire PST into it. That sort of could be qualified as a migration tool which you didn't want to use. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I guess. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I look at what's out of the box differently than uh, than like going have to 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 uh, apply a third party or external tool. But and for I guess, that matter, I believe exchange online has got tools to do that with. Yeah. I think it's a PowerShell, actually. I think they have a PowerShell that will actually to do that. I have to look it up. I mean, I look at a question like that, and somebody saying, look, I'm not authorized to go and add a tool into the system or to, to acquire something. Um, so it, it, you know, I, I almost interpret that as, you know, what can I do with what I already have out of the box? But, yeah. yeah. So you've I got multiple options. That- People, once again, it's kind of like the last question people forget about the fact is they kind of have cloud and Office 365 in their mind as kind of this foreign concept. And what they need to remember is that a PST file is still a PST file, right? And so you can export a PST file and open a PST file in your client application. And what's really nice is because the client application data syncs with the cloud data, it, it's all the same thing. And I think people kind of get hung up on the, well, how do I get it to the cloud? <laughs> as opposed to understanding how kind of the the dynamics work behind the scenes. I've got a t-shirt that says the cloud is just someone else's computer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke about that. You're like, you know, the, my, my private cloud. It's like, you, you mean your external drive? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> See it floating there? <laughs> yeah. So I did post a link, uh, uh, Christian, that actually Microsoft is talking about being able to do that import um, using network capabilities. So uh, Microsoft has come out with a, a way to do it natively. Cool. And if you're doing a lot of PST files, that gets a little trickier than just a single PST file as well. Well, mm-hmm. and 
the reason why I say that is because this PowerShell command is now available, which I didn't. Um, maybe I missed it, but uh, let me paste this in the chat. Um, I didn't realize this is available, but there actually is a whoops. <laughs> paste, Mike. Um, there actually is a new mailbox import request command uh, commandlet in PowerShell. Nice. It'll do that. So, so for anybody that's watching in the uh, follow-up blog post, which will include a, a link to the video and everything, will I'll have all of the questions that we discuss as well as all of the links that we share over. If you don't catch them in the meeting chat on the right side, all right. All right, we're ready for question number five. Nobody's ready? Or emotionally, are we ready? Well, if you can pronounce that first name, we're ready. Uh, Imran? Is it Imran? I'm Ron. Oh. I'm Ran. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so I have I've run into a big problem. I'm using the SharePoint list as my data source uh, with attachments inside the items. I came to know that my list has reached the 250 meg uh, size limit due to all attachments. Any alternative solutions for attachments for SharePoint items through Power Apps using document library, which have a link in the SharePoint list items? Yo, SharePoint people. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a couple different questions going on in there. It's, <laughs> I mean, if he's if he's doing attachments in the list, usually the way I get around that is to use a document library and reference the item in the list as opposed to having the attachment actually in the list item. I don't know if that's us, if there's a size limitation specifically around Power Apps. But definitely one of the big workarounds is to use a document library and reference the item in the list as opposed to using attachments. I love Sean's face. I know. I, I, There's I so wanted, much going on in I, this statement. I wanted a screenshot of just Sean's face when he was looking at <laughs> I, I just don't know what to say. It's not rocket science, Sean. It's only SharePoint. <laughs> 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 That'd make a great T-shirt. Yeah, it would. It's not I was watching. Um, I was watching Harry Potter over the weekend, and there's one of my favorite quotes that uh, uh, that Professor Snape uses. Is is well, I can. It's the um, what's the now now it just slipped my mind. Uh, the uh, um, oh now I'm gonna I can't. It's where he's talking about um, art versus science. He's like the the inexact science and exact art of potions, something like that. It was uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's uh, it's as much art as it is. Now I got to find the quote. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> Anything, Sean? Or are we just moving on? Just uh... no. I <laughs> okay. Here it is. It says. It's just uh, he says there will be no foolish wand waving or silly incantations in this class. As such, I don't expect many of you to appreciate the subtle science and exact art that is potion making. That's what it is. It's the subtle science and exact art yep. of SharePoint <laughs> maintenance. <laughs> so true. Yes. That would have been so much better had I had the ability. To I like the that. science. I like the science. Science. Thomas Dolby. Yes. <laughs> nah, I'm not. I think Sean's taking that. a pass on this one, so we can just move on. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. Number six, Volton says, uh, "How can I fix my mic input uh, for two not accepting with external sound interface on sound settings?" So it's a Teams question, where it's not picking up his second microphone input. That's how I'm interpreting. If you question. can't make it flash and <laughs> control panel sounds, I don't think you can. That's what I say, it's a device problem, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we've talked about this in previous sessions 
where uh, just yes. because it works with Windows does not mean it'll work with Teams. Well, and just because it works one day doesn't mean it'll work the next day because sometimes yeah. Teams changes its mind. It does. Right. It does. Because I mean, we've had this conversation <laughs> where my camera will work before this show in a Zoom meeting, but fire up Teams and Teams is like, nah, -uh. no yeah. camera. Sorry. I, b I believe, and don't quote me on this, but somebody was, I was uh, on a, a call and was really impressed with their brand new Surface headphones, which apparently were having problems working with Teams. Yeah, yep. that happens. Yeah. They had problems with the Surface headphones working with the Surface, if you remember when it first came out. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, as we often say, you know, the, the era of plug and play is dead. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Plug and pray. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would definitely say um, there are multiple places that tell you um, which devices are the most friendly with teams. Um, maybe take a look at that and uh, reconsider what mic you're using. <laughs> Um, sound settings, you're... Bluetooth settings. I thought you were going to say there for a second is like reconsider the choices you're making in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm finding really cool, uh, mics and cameras to try to find the one that gives me the best everything and is the friendliest. So I mean, I think that's a, it's a little bit more about just you know maybe picking a different mic. Yeah. Well, like everything, I mean, it, you, it's exciting to go get the latest greatest technology but you need to be aware of what's supported by the primary applications you're using so i tell people i like to be on the cutting edge i don't like to be on the bleeding edge yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. true so i've used that and, and just a little hint here <clears throat> i've used an app called ear trumpet has anybody heard of ear trumpet oh i've got that here you betcha good, okay. good piece of software <clears throat> it is and uh, you can actually download it from the the microsoft store Yep. Um, but uh, it actually shows you all of your inputs mm -hmm. and it'll show you levels and everything about your inputs as it as they're being used. So that's it's it's kind of cool. You'll be able to actually see if the you know uh, the different apps that are using your inputs and stuff like that. It is it brings to mind like um, Monty Python skit. That's yes. an awesome product. Yes. <laughs> I've got the link to it here. I'll paste that in there include that <laughs> oh, that's great yeah that's cool uh all right uh question seven um heart asks anyone know how to email a team so that if pretty straightforward five team not you mean a team in teams correct a okay, group. Yeah, the teams. You can email the group. Oh, hang on. Clarification: Teams or group? Because a team is really, you know, it every time you team you create, you have to. Isn't there a box that says like, do you want to create an email or allow emails to this team or something? Yeah. Sure. When you first yeah. Set it up. There's a little default that automatically subscribes any new members to receive the email. Yep. But, yep. but they individually have the right to manage their own settings in terms of not getting those notifications. So you can default it where they get it or you can default it where they don't, but they always have the right to add it or delete it afterwards. So that gets to be a really tricky question because it depends on how the default settings were set at the beginning and it depends on if your users in the group have changed their settings. Yeah, dang users. And that's, that's where policy comes in because you can change that in policy globally you know, to have enforce the policy where the, everyone has to receive like email, you know, from an administrator, things like that. But there is a quick way to go in, whether it's been enabled or not, and whether it's available in the channel that you're talking, trying to reach, is to go into the channel on the ellipses on the right side, you know, click on the three dots and get the email address and copy that over and then send your email to that. That's actually, uh, it's a, something that I do often. And I know that there is, uh, there are feature requests that are in place to put it within the UI to make it easier to um, share content from Outlook. Like there'll be an email conversation 
and I'll get an email and be like, why is this happening outside of the discussion that we're having yeah. over in teams? And so I will email that thread over to teams and people want the ability to do that either way. And you, you start to see a lot of messages now where teams conversation is pushed over to email to get out to a broader audience and it redirects them back to that team as well. So depending on where you want to have that conversation, but I will use it often to redirect misplaced discussion threads in email back to teams where everybody can see it. Well, and on this case, they're talking about creating a calendar event. Yeah, the second the, part of the question, right? Which, which is, is the, the limited event. Yeah, so I'll read that. It says uh, the other it says also. That's the hint for me of the, the second question. So <laughs> heart, you're getting the the double play here. Sharp, uh, as, a, sharp as a tack as always, Christian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> that praise warms my heart. Uh, uh, also, I'm having an issue creating a calendar event for the team and having the team get the invite without adding the members individually. Yeah. So Sharon, you were saying. That goes back to the group calendar, which um, has a couple different ways that people can get updates, but essentially if they're using the group calendar and they are subscribed to receive updates um, via the group, then they should be getting updates, anything you add to the calendar. But if they have chosen to unsubscribe themselves from that or to stop following that group, then they will not get notifications for that. But one of the things it does say is without adding the members individually. So another thing you can do to get around that is if they have unsubscribed themselves, you can actually add them to that event individually and then they will get the out of the box individual notifications as well. <laughs> You can't escape those notifications. They will find you. Mm -hmm. They're like the IRS. So, um, I and this is actually a really good time to talk about a new feature that I don't necessarily know that a lot of people um, know about, um, but there's the channel calendar. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know about the channel calendar, if you um, go into Teams and go into Apps and type in channel calendar, you can actually add a calendar for any team and any channel, um, and it'll display the group calendar associated with that team. Um, which is it's brand new, it's super cool um, and it does exact. So if you want your team to know about what's on the group calendar and you don't want to have to put it on a SharePoint page and then add the link to the tab, you can use the new channel calendar feature, pick which team you want to display it in and your whole team can see what's on the calendar at a glance. Woohoo. We'll have to. Um... I'll go look for a link to include. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can grab you one. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, question number eight. This is from Jeff. It says, greetings all. I have a current 365 family subscription. Every time I start Excel, PowerPoint, or Word, there is a pop-up screen asking for my email address sign-on. How do I disable this pop-up across all of the components, please? I don't think that's possible, actually, um, because it's driven by the subscription type. Because if you, if, I know that in Office 2019, the local copy, it only it allows you to continue on without logging in. It'll prompt you once, um, but I've noticed that it doesn't prompt after that. But when I installed my Office 365 home use, it prompts all the time. I mean, I can I can click through it, but it prompts continuously, and I think that's a subscription model. I think that, and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think the subscription model keeps prompting you, because it not only is it want you to log in to do the sharing features, but it also logs in for licensing purposes. Yeah, um, because it is a subscription feature. There are different installs as well. Yeah. So it's yeah. depending on the, the install also, is I'm running. On, on any of these uh, notes, you to check and see what uh, what your account information looks like, and that would be by going to File Account Off or Office Account if you're in more uh, Outlook, and uh, check and see who it says this actually belongs to. Uh, you can add accounts to to it. And uh, that may get you out of that problem because I, I when I, I, I really don't have to do any of that. 
Uh, if I if I launch Excel, it just launches. Well, when I'm in my work laptop, which is 100% dedicated to those accounts, and I log into that, I don't have those login issues. Right. Yeah. Uh, on my my primary workstation, which I use for all the community, for my former company, you know, email, and I've got those different profiles, and I'm switching between it. It's exactly that scenario where I yes. run into that because. I might be logged in with different profiles and different tools and different systems. Exactly. And so it's, it's doing that check. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I almost look at that as kind of like an MFA, you know, activity anyway. I'm used to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and especially, another, um, go ahead. Sure. No, I, I was just going to say another thing that a lot of people don't realize is in Windows 10, you can have multiple user accounts logged in at the same time, yes. uh, which credentials you for those things. So one of the things I always recommend is if you go to your Windows 10 search bar and just type in users, um, you can go to all of your user accounts and there's actually two or three different um, places. So click on all the links on the left hand side um, and check and see which logins are log in, logged into that particular device and make sure that you want them to be logged in. Um, because if not, it could actually be creating a scenario where the tool or the, the product is trying to figure out which account am I using for this? And that yeah. kind of helps to clean it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would just say that uh, without more context around the question, right? I don't I don't know <laughs> why why this person doesn't want to log in and then once they log in, that won't bother you anymore, right? Um, but you have a subscription, a family, Microsoft M365 family is a subscription-based model, just like home and business, just like, uh, you know, um, an E3, an E5, whatever. <clears throat> you have to log in in order for, you know, what we used to call KMS on-premises out in the cloud now to actually say, okay, yeah, you're valid for a license. Go ahead, you can continue using this. Um, you have to log in at some point. I mean, it used to be like 30 days, and then you get that what degraded functionality or something like that if if you didn't log in and and renew that license. Um, if you're running a standalone version of Office, then no, you don't have to log in. But I don't know why you wouldn't. I don't. I don't. I, I guess I need more information around why the concern is around this. What the concern is. Yeah. Additional information that we will never receive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want they maybe, want to stay logged in feature is what they want. <laughs> well, not only that, maybe they maybe they only want that one person, right? To be yeah. logged in and that one ID and not, you know, they don't have the whole family where like me, I have a home and home and business one and I have you can use up to six now. It used to be five, now it's up to six. And all of my, you know, my two kids and my my wife, they all log in with their their own accounts. Maybe this person doesn't have that. And they just have that one account and that's all they want to use. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. But then those other people are missing out on all the benefits of that account, like OneDrive storage and, you know, that other stuff. So. Yep. That's the answer, though. As Mike says, go and buy multiple licenses. <laughs> Everyone should have five to seven licenses in your household from your two-year-old through your great-grandmother. So right. make great stocking right. stuffers. That's right. Well, you only have to buy one license and you get to use it up to six times. Sean will also talk to you about the need for every home to have a NAS storage device. Right. And and yeah. how will walk us through the install of your exchange on prem environment? <laughs> so all of it necessary. Absolutely. So oh, and Sharon's team can help you build automated automated workflows across all of that. So so what's easy, your value add, Christian? Easy as pie. No, I I I just will sit and watch, and be entertained by that. You need a value add. No, I no, I don't. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on. Question number nine. Uh, Diane says, "I hope this makes sense." Diane, we hope so too. So thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Do any of you know if the person who established the Teams chat closes it or deletes it, will all messages disappear on my end? Or is it like email and uh, I keep what has been sent regardless of the owner changing the status of their own uh, uh, chat? 
So what happens well, with with a chat message? <laughs> I don't know. I've still got chat this week, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the simple things. <laughs> yeah. No, it. If the chat gets closed by the person who started the chat in the first place, then the chat is gone. It ain't there no more. That's kind of what I was thinking too. I think it's whoever creates it, creates it inside of their exchange account. I do also know when you share files inside of a chat, it's shared out of your OneDrive. So it depends on who shares the file as to whether they keep it or, you know, because it's their file that they're sharing. But that's my understanding was that the chat lives in the creator's exchange. Yeah. Ownership assigned at creation time. So that doesn't get and that also goes for meetings as well. So whoever creates the meeting actually owns the chat for that meeting. So that's an interesting point you bring up. Is that the case then that when you're in a Teams meeting and I post a file to the Teams meeting and, or the, the team chat and it doesn't go it doesn't go into the into the Teams SharePoint OneDrive? No, it stays in your OneDrive and it's shared with whoever you want to share it with. Huh. If you share it, if you share it personally, so if you add add attachment in Teams, it's sh it's going to add that file to your OneDrive, and then it's going to share it to any of the participants. That's I've tested that out multiple times, and it's always worked that way. Now, if huh? you were to add a file to SharePoint, and then share the link to it, that's different. But if you simply click add attachment or upload file or whatever, it's going to add it to your OneDrive and then share it to anybody else. OK, that makes sense because I've been in teams. Well, you guys know being in teams with Microsoft folks and some of those oh, file listings yeah. will get very long, but the Microsoft folks aren't there anymore. And but the files still exist, mm -hmm. so they must do it internally at in Microsoft SharePoint site, like you said, and do it that way. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah you have to think through kind of what you're trying to accomplish and whether or not you're just simply sharing it with other people or whether you want to make it available to the group at large as to yeah. where you store it. Yep and how you share it, um, which it, it does get confusing. Um, just as a tip inside of Teams, you can always go to the Files tab on the left. And if you look at OneDrive, um, if you go into OneDrive, you can actually see the files that have been shared with you. Um, and you can see the files that you have shared um, inside of T inside of OneDrive. Um, and it'll, show, it'll tell you which ones you're sharing out and which ones have been shared with you um, in the OneDrive app um, in the cloud. Yeah, makes sense. So just a clarification on the chat conversation. If you're a member of a chat, you're part of that conversation. You have the ability to see the conversation that you participated in. If you're removed for like a, from a channel conversation, um, then of course that lives on, but you only see what you had access to. And if you rejoin, you will miss, uh, mm -hmm. you will not see all of the chat that happened while you were not within that space. Okay. But similarly with a with a chat, so there is a like there is your portion of that. If you are a Teams user, so there's that cloud exchange. I know Microsoft has talked has talked about for a while of creating for if there's an on-prem user with the hybrid connector and they're in participating in that chat. Um, but there's I guess the point is that the um, you will have your portion like the conversation you participated in will remain within your profile attached to your profile you just won't see the rest of of that and that's a so you can go and audit that and get access to that that's good to as know long as, as long as you don't clear that out then as you long as that. as long as your administrative settings don't prohibit chat in some way or whitelist chat in some way as well so there is an overriding piece to that that if because we have clients where we've had to turn chat off for certain reasons. Um, so as long as your administrator has enabled you to use chat and as long as your administrator has enabled um, you to use chat with that other place, then you should also be fine. That That's cool right. to know. So you think about that, you know, like your, your auditing capability and to, to go in and see everything, you know, with the, there was a lot of, I remember, you know, a lot of questions that people had concerns about what your IT organization could go in there and see. It's like, well, within channel messages, that conversation versus chat, mm -hmm. which is whether it's a group chat or one-to-one -one chat that's happening, only the people that are participants in that chat yeah. can see that. 
In great. fact, um, so that's actually another really good point to bring up that I talk about a lot in training is that if you have a one on one chat, that's considered a private chat. If you add an additional person, it then switches from a private chat to a group chat and they don't you don't have any choice to share that information. But if you have more than two people, it's considered a group chat from the beginning. If you add an additional person, you can choose whether or not they can see the history, the previous, how much of right. the history. Um, but that's only available in group chats, which is something that is considered three or more people. Otherwise, it's a private chat and you don't get that option. Right. Yep. Which is a cool feature. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Question number 10. Um, Ron asks, my desktop Outlook program has a rule that if there's something special in the subject line, it goes to a special folder even though it is going to the same email that prevents me from seeing it on my email. How can I fix it so I can see it on my iPhone? <laughs> I'm guessing what's happening. I read this earlier. I'm guessing what's happening is that they have a rule to put it in a folder and they just don't have the folders exposed in their iPhone mail. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty easy fix. Um, you just click the little back arrow at the top and it'll take you to all the accounts and you expand the account to see the folders. <laughs> And then you say, show me this folder. Because it only shows the inbox by default in the iPhone mail. That was something I kind of learned early on. Um, yeah. That's my guess. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. That's basically the same way on Android works. You don't see the special folders unless you go look for the special folders. And then once you find them, you sync them. And once you've done that, then it's all there. Well, that's actually a good point, too, because in the mail settings, um, you have to determine how long back you want to sync the, the folder exactly. detail. And so if you if you haven't set that up, it won't be there either. Yeah, or if you did that, that, as you suggest, that message is a month old and you've got your sync stopping at two weeks, mm -hmm. you won't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually a, a, a feature, something that I do in switching, and I, I, so I was aware of that. Um, and, and we'll we'll look at the kind of the all up all email across the multiple accounts. Um, but I will during the day, especially if I'm at an event or something, I'll have it focused just on the the work email, so I'm not bothered by personal email, a Gmail account, some other you know Outlook based account. I'm only seeing those things which mm -hmm. I really need to prioritize. So if it's something that is uh, you know important that you're watching, you know then go and and change your view so that's just that folder where that's and also be forewarned that if you go into those sync settings and you sync everything for all time um, that your backup subscription plan will increase in price uh, and your phone may run out of memory <laughs> or that <laughs> yeah uh all right Question number 11, Malco says, hello, anyone here knows how to create a virtual Microsoft phone extension, MS phone extension, which can be logged into a Microsoft Teams phone? You did this on purpose, Christian. Of course I did. You did this on purpose. <laughs> nope. And it's it's all Sean's answer. We'll let Sean answer. <laughs> I know. Sean, what do you think? Telephony. You know, I, I'm just like, I don't even know what that is. And a Microsoft phone extension. Um, and I mean, I know what a phone extension is, but it's like. Uh, yes, yes, you can. We have we actually have a client who uses Teams phones, who has Teams devices, um, and we've got calling set up for them, um, and we've got their extensions going to their Teams phones. Um, and overall, um, there's been a few things we've been working through because it's fairly new, but overall it's been working well and they like it. So yeah, it's just part of the voice package in Teams. So this is a question where, I don't know, I would go up to the browser and do a search. I have to believe that Microsoft has documentation on creating uh, phone extensions for Teams. There is an entire section um, on Docs around Microsoft Teams administration in the voice area, and it walks you through the bulk of this. And once you've read that and feel good at it, um, you add that to your knowledge set and go get your uh, MS 700. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, the other thing too is that, it, and here's just kind of a general statement around, uh, look, there are no bad questions. The only, well, no, the only bad questions are the just questions bad never people. asked. Yes, just bad people, correct. <laughs> um, 
No, but it, you know there there are, and I would say that uh, the a lot of the questions which we receive would be difficult just to go and do a search and find the right answers. There's conflicting information, things that are out there. And I like to think that we're providing some actual value here. No, no, no. In, uh, in fact, theory, you know, in we're fact, providing it's so funny because value. Many, many years ago, um, there was somebody who asked me a question and I kind of chuckled and I answered the question. And then I was talking to my husband and I was like, why didn't they just search for that? And he looked at me and he said, they don't know what to search for. And yeah. I was like, that really like hit me hard because he was like, you can tell them to the words to search for. They don't even know what they're yeah. looking for. And yeah. so I think if if nothing else, if we can provide people with the context of here's some things to think about and here's some things you yeah. can go search for to get you to that next level, I think that provides more value than we really realize. Well, that's the other thing. I know that we always uh, kind of uh, whine and complain that we don't have the ability to ask other follow-up questions, Mike. Um, yes. <laughs> um, but but the reality is that there could be people that are, uh, you know, we might have a question. And as we try to go through and say, look, there's a bunch of potential ways that this problem could, you know, come into play. And we're therefore, if we have five different ways of solving the problem, depending on the context, there's there's five, at least five people out there that have their problem solved mm -hmm. in theory. Because if one person's the, asking, the rest are no, thinking no. it. The, from yeah. the literally dozens of people who will see this, uh, this video. It's also worth mentioning oh. that the internet with its longevity, uh, people don't pay attention to dates. Right. They're not trained to look at dates. Yes. Something's published and if you, you know, find an article that's six years old, that has a good chance of not being relevant anymore. Exactly. Oh, Sean, oh my gosh, all day, whenever I search for anything, I now use the tools feature and I limit it to like the yeah. last month or last 12 months because <laughs> you're so right because I'm so tired of looking for something and then having the answer pop up, especially when it's your own blog, um, from yeah. like five years ago <laughs> that answers that very question. You're like, but that doesn't work no, like that. No, <laughs> no but the, but my favorite from that scenario, not like this didn't just happen, uh, is somebody <laughs> then commenting on articles like that saying that it's like, well, that didn't work for me. I'm like, that article was from 2016. <laughs> it's the wrong product. Yeah. It doesn't do it there. The born on date is over. Yes, yeah. the nope. answer for SharePoint 2010 is not the same answer as SharePoint Online, guys. Like Good it's Lord, two different no. products. There's a no. The, my other favorite though is that I keep seeing like retweets uh, for like make, make sure that you check out my webinar happening tomorrow from a year ago. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, somebody somebody just liked a tweet about a webinar. This just happened over the weekend from 2018. Somebody needs to update their Hootsuite settings. Um, yeah. Just saying. So, and I just want to add to that is that I, I run into this on a daily basis with my family is they will come to me because they think that I'm a search god and I have the ability to find answers because yes. I just, plain and simple, I just tell them, <clears throat> Number one, you have to know what you're looking for and the right words to use because everything on the internet is, everything in search is built off of keywords. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, search is all about keywords, okay? So using a lot of common terms will get you nowhere very fast. Um, dates are another thing, but also don't be like my family and always select the first result you get as the answer okay yeah. Yeah. but it, but mike it's at the top yeah and it has Why a little word in front of it that says add yeah. ad promoted <laughs> yeah. there's a reason why it, it's not right in our house we call it google food yeah. yeah i just i mean google. i deal with that i mean literally on a daily basis because they'll they'll come down and they'll be like well i need to find this out but I don't know how to search for it. Dad, search for it for me. And then I'll bring it up and I'll be like, well, they'll be like, oh, there it is. And I go, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay. This one might be it. I, I actually <laughs> Google that do a presentation you. called, uh, how did you find that? Yeah. And I, I talk about how search works and you know how you can get more out of search just because of that exact thing. Yep. She just yeah. did a plug, plug. Since we're we're giving a disclaimer to uh, search capabilities, I'll just once again I'll flash on the screen here the disclaimer for the show here. Uh, 
Um, again, just to put it out there, I, I, I think it's just, uh, you know, part of our, uh, our, that should our, just pop up. You should have it on a timer. Yeah, just fades in, fades every, out. Our opinions are a lower out. third that goes every, across every the Every time Sean the talks, just at the beginning of it, hold hold pause for the Sean disclaimer. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> the Bloomberg but, streamer. That's right. Us, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, question 12. Davison asks, Hi, is there a way to call the information from two related tables in a dataverse on the Power Apps uh, canvas? I'm out. <laughs> I've never <laughs> used dataverse. <laughs> Neither have I. I mean, dataverse is just a fancy term new. for CDS. So we do it too. <laughs> two data sources. <laughs> yeah, you can you can use two tables in a Power App in a Canvas app, but um, that's a much bigger loaded question. Um, and I would highly recommend that you do the Learn course on Dataverse and Power Apps, um, <laughs> just to help you understand how that all works. I think that's a saying yes, and then saying go uh, and learn about this. Get some. Uh, Skill yourself up is a great right. response. Or that. pay a really smart consultant like Sharon Weaver to help you out. Absolutely. I, I have multiple consulting. Power Apps people on my team that could definitely help you. Although, so Sharon's only the CEO of Smarter Consulting. I uh, recently started working with Smartest Consulting, <laughs> and they're they're <laughs> slightly better. <laughs> so just it's FYI. Led by Dogbert. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those. That's one of those Classic. family jokes that we always do to, to kind of, you know. I think this is great. Well, that's 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 awesome that you think that, Dad. I think this other thing is even greater, you know. So we we do that to each other. It's we the passive aggressive together. You know. that's, right. that's right. Uh, all right. Uh, question thirteen. Tracy says, "Can some t someone tell me how to create an alert on a shared document in Teams?" after there's been an update to it? Yeah, go, go into SharePoint and click alert me. <laughs> yeah, go into SharePoint. That's the key, I think. You're not going to do it from Teams. No, no, absolutely. In Teams, um, at the top of any library where it says files, there's a little button that says open in SharePoint. Click open in SharePoint. It will take you to exactly the right place. Click on the bar. There's a little dot, dot, dot. If you don't see it, click on alert me. Fill out the fields. You're good to go. Alert yep. me's are actually the reason I got into SharePoint uh, 15 plus years ago, because um, I thought they were the coolest feature ever, um, and I still do. I still think alert me's are probably one of the best kind of unsung heroes of SharePoint. Yep, that is a great, it's one of the stealth or stalking features. Uh, if you want to see what's happening around content, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it used to be like that. I so I I know it's 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 shameful to say this, but the alerting feature, as well as the back in the Skype days, remember this? We've all done it, where you get alerted when somebody uh, comes online via Skype, mm -hmm. like instantly get the desktop app. Yeah, and they oh. added that right. It was missing initially, and people asked about that. So alert when people come online. It's a great when you're when you're a project manager. And you're trying to drive people to complete certain documents, assets, or activities. These are great tools, people, but I would refer to them as the stocking apps. Does your parole officer know you're talking? <laughs> I just think that was hilarious. My son would be like, he's like, how do you, I'm like, I just logged in. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> And I'd re I'd message him like it's like I know that you see this like I I see you online yeah, you know? and he would go to switch his status to busy and I'm like yeah well played. That's the focus <laughs> time is amazing because it automatically marks you as do not disturb if you don't know that, um, which has been really great for me because I think sometimes you just need like a few minutes to like do your own thing and not have people bother you, um, and so I love it that it just automatically puts me on do not disturb like a couple hours a week. <laughs> All right. So, um, well, yeah. Before well, you before you move yes. on. Yes. Christian, I have to I have to question 
<clears throat> the list. And okay. the reason why I have to do that is because I'm looking at question number 16. I uh, now I have I know all transparency. I have not read these questions ahead of time. But why would not this question, which he says needed urgently for Monday at 9 a.m., <laughs> go to the yeah. top of the list? That's right. Because <laughs> it was already after 9 a.m., so. So, That's the sorry. Time yeah. sorry, it's Simon. Only 9 15 here. It's mm -hmm. Christian's fault. <laughs> it's he could be in Hawaii. Yeah. You just you didn't think of that. He's part of he's out in Alaska or Hawaii, so it's still plenty of time. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so um yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's it so there is a way to um to put money in my Patreon account to have <laughs> items move up on the list. No. Just kidding. Wow. That great observation and that <laughs> Let me tell you, it initially was up at the top of the list, and you get some sense as I build the list and move questions around, and I ignored that part. So, sorry. <laughs> so, we're not going to answer that question yet. Let's move on with question number 14. Um, Jacques says, I deleted my Azure resources, but I'm getting billed for a backup, and I cannot delete the resource or the pay-as-you-go subscription. I do not want to get billed anymore. Where do I go from here? Please assist. So um, if he actually deleted the resource, all of his resources, so he goes into all resources in the left-hand pane in, in the Azure portal, um, and he sees no resources listed on the right-hand side, okay? Um, there is no backup, okay? There is no... Unless he had a managed service that created some kind of a backup somewhere, but it would be listed as a resource. So the first place I would take this is a support ticket because there, there's no way for a resource for you to be getting billed for a resource that you cannot see inside of the portal. Is there like a is there like a soft delete? Is there a, a way to like a 30 day? hold that you'd still be billed for so you delete something yes no, there is a no covers okay no right. there is not um there are things that you can that can be deleted that kind of like hang out there so it, one example is that is a, what they call a managed app sometimes a managed app contains like multiple components all right it's a managed application and there may be a database behind it and a load balancer and a couple of vms and you know all these different resources well, sometimes you can delete all the components of a managed app, but the managed app object itself never goes away. It just kind of, they call it an orphan. It just sits there, okay? Now you could still be billed for that managed app. There's no resources using the app, but you still get billed for that object that still exists in an orphan state. So you need to call, you need to open a ticket with support. And what they'll do is they'll actually go into your subscription and find out what all the IDs are all the resource IDs that are still active and give you an explanation of that of why I, I, I it's hard for me to understand why they're getting billed on something called a backup. I don't I don't know where they're getting that term from, but um, that's that would be my suggestion is let's support do the work for you on this one. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah, I, I found that Azure support um was pretty reasonable i went in early on when i moved uh, parts of my environment over there and went in and said you know i don't know what this is i don't you know this is how i'm actually using it and they made su some suggestions on uh, uh switching my configuration around and then refunded part of what i was charged the previous yeah. month for that so i mean they, yeah. they saw my usage levels low it was new on there trying to figure stuff out and yeah, so yeah, definitely go have that conversation with them. They're pretty good with that. And not only the second part of that is um, when they talked about <clears throat> can't delete the subscription, Microsoft won't allow you to delete a subscription that has resources in it unless you, I mean, you confirm it. But if you do that, it just goes into a suspended state. It's not actually deleted because there are resources that are still active. And you can always reactivate that subscription for a period of time. Okay, like you said, a 30-day recycle bin. 
So you can let a, a subscription pause or suspend as they call it, um, but you can't delete it outright. Yeah, and this is also, um, I'm just gonna plug, this is a really good reason to have a Microsoft partner. Um, that, you know, we're getting to the point that a lot of small and medium sized businesses can go spin up their own licensing, they can spin up their own Azure, they can do what they wanna do with things. And then sometimes I think they get stuck um, when they need support or if they have questions or they need to escalate. Um, and Microsoft partners can assist um, with a lot of those types of things sometimes, whether they answer questions or tell you it's the right time to open a ticket or open that ticket on your behalf and help you with it. Um, I, I think that that can be really handy sometimes to have somebody in your court, so. Good point. Yep, thank you for that. Um, question 15. Oh, we're so close to helping Simon with his urgent <laughs> question. Um, question 15. <laughs> It'd be so funny if we ran out of time after this question. Uh, but mm. Kathleen asks, I want to assign, we're, we're trying to find ways to provide value for the community. So. <laughs> And when we can't, we'll go down burning in a big way. <laughs> Kathleen asks, I, I want to assign tasks in a private channel, but this is not supported. I, I support you, Kathleen. Um, what is the easiest way to assign one-off tasks for a private channel? Can Trello or Asana do one-off tasks, or are they specifically for projects? <laughs> you make some good ones today, Christian. Yeah, well, so for so this, the only reason I'm aware of this, uh, so done some research around private channels, um, but uh, you know, yeah, there's there's limitations, of course, around private channels, and uh, you know, as it relates to the rest of the group that it's uh, a part of, um, but it's that's one of the great scenarios of the list app, and actually going and creating kind of the task lists uh, in the list app, so you can. Uh, have the list app and create a list within a private channel and then assign tasks that way. So that's one real simple solution that's available out of the box. You don't have to go to a third party solution. Having said that, if you have some other third party task management software that your company uses, um, you can always add that in as a tab and have that as a resource as well. But you you don't have to go outside for that capability. You You also can create a plan um, a single plan that has limited, um, you can put it for that group and then you can actually publish it into that channel too. Yep. Yeah, multiple ways. Okay, well, let's see. Do we have time? I don't know, six minutes. Is that really? Okay, Simon, question number 16. Uh, Simon says, I'm looking for, see what I did there, Sean? Uh, I'm looking for some assistance. I'm on Windows 10. I installed Teams, but it won't let me log in. Getting an error code 8 bajillion D. Uh, I have uh, uninstalled and reinstalled and cleared the cache. My kids have been using Teams via a school platform. Need urgently for Monday at 9 a.m. Again, I imagine Simon is in Hawaii, so plenty of time. Any Use help? the browser app. Yeah. Use the online app. Use the mobile app. Quit trying to install the client. <laughs> If his That's kids are using answer. it, how are they? That would certainly get the job done quickly. Yeah. That but error if you're code. Issues with the team, with a client-based app, just use the browser-based app and be done with it. Do they have distinct accounts on the machine? All sorts of. I mean, there's all sorts of things. So many questions. Yeah. That's back to that one we talked about late earlier, where I would go to your search bar, look at users, check to see who's logged into your machine, see if it's conflicting. But if I needed something urgently, um, I might just simply go to the browser app or use the mobile app on my phone, worst case scenarios. Also, if you need something urgently, um, probably not a Hail Mary question asked on a uh, Facebook community page. <laughs> Another good reason to have a Microsoft partner. Yes, to go to for those questions that have an SLA in place, correct. Yeah, if you use that browser, Use an incognito or in private window as well. Make sure nothing's interfering with you. Yeah. All right, uh, question 17, uh, Zeke asks, does Office 365 have email notifications for users whose passwords will be expiring? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Question number 18. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You want to expand on that one? <laughs> no, no expansion necessary. I think it all automatically <laughs> just happens, right? Like if it's yeah. expiring, you get a notification that says, I think it's like a 10 day countdown or something. And I don't know what the countdown is, but yes. <laughs> well, you get like, you get, you've got 10 days, you've got nine days, you've got yeah. eight days. Or, nine. or Mike, oh. even simpler 10, 9, 8, 7. That's a countdown. Just of course, to wondering. receive those, you need a valid email address. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Presumably the one you're using to log in, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is probably our last question here. Uh, number 18, Ash asks, uh, hi, guys, is it possible to merge two calendars to the standard Teams calendar? No. Not, that not, I'm aware. Not, not out of the box. There you go. I well, wish there, it did. Yeah. I'm ready for it to happen, but no. Hmm. It, it only displays your own personal Outlook count. It's whatever you have on your Outlook calendar is what displays on the, the default calendar. Here's a great software opportunity for a budding developer. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, there's some new apps that are coming out that are going to try to you know solve this problem. Um, I, I'm excited to see where this is going to go because I think there's a lot of great use cases to see multiple calendars, just like you do in Outlook where you have your overlapped calendars um, in Teams. But um, this question has been out there for a long time, uh, you know, back in the SharePoint 2010 days. In fact, I seem to recall in a chapter that I wrote for a book with uh, with Jennifer Mason uh, on <laughs> solutions where we addressed this in SharePoint, but uh, a merged calendar view and building that out. And, you know, it, it remains a, a an issue where why Microsoft, why can we not um, create a view that merges multiple calendars and publish that as the default? You know, we need to have flexibility with calendar views inside of Teams as the default view there's a lot of opportunity there and I, I do know there's some things that are coming that like third party stuff that i've seen that are starting to kind of deal with that issue but yep well uh we are out of time i know we had uh four other questions on the list which will go to the front of the line and uh, only two of the four are urgent need the answer today so we'll address <laughs> them next week <laughs> Uh, but uh, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, for those that are watching, we'll be back at the same time, 8 a.m. Pacific uh, next week. Um, every Monday we'll be back and do this again. If you have some questions, reach out to us through social. You can find us out on Facebook. This, of course, uh, the recording will be up on uh, on YouTube and the Cloud Talk channel, and I'll also add a blog post out. I'm, I, I still owe the, the post from last week but we'll have a link list. I've been busy, been doing some work stuff, you know, yeah. um, but we'll, uh, but I'm just about caught up and we'll have that all out there live. I don't know if you guys saw it. I actually went and posted our eight episodes on the app point channel. They're up on the blog now as well, so that we have the consistent run through of all the episodes. Cool. Coolio. So episode 52 will be up later this week with a link list to every question that we answered all the links that we've shared and discussed. I'm going to go grab uh, all of Sherry's links that she uploaded before she dropped off. And all that will be in the blog post, which you can find at buckleyplanet.com. And with that, so Sharon, Sean, Mike, and Hal, thank you so much. And to, of course, Riz never showed up, so he's dead to us. Uh, but, <laughs> but to Neil and Sherry. Uh, Sleeps with the fishes. Sitting. That's right. And uh, with that, we will uh, sign off and we'll see you next week. Yeah. See you later. Take okay. care. Take care, everybody. Bye.
and far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true.